Hi, this is Matt McCormick in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. My email address is mccormick at csus.edu. And today we're going to talk about deductively strong arguments. So we've had several discussions now about the logical form of arguments. We've considered valid and cogent arguments, and now I can introduce this distinction. Deductive arguments are valid. Inductive arguments are cogent. So they're different kinds of logical structure. And We've done tests now and had lectures and studied uh, the way those logical forms work at some length. And early on in the semester, I made a distinction between the content and the form of a sentence or an argument. And so we've been considering the logical form. Now we're going to start to consider the content. And now it becomes important for us to think about whether or not you actually believe the conclusion, whether or not the reasons given are good reasons to accept the conclusion. And that's to say we're going to measure to see if an argument is strong. So we're interested first today in deductively strong arguments. So a deductively strong argument has two features. First, it's value valid and S, so the person considering the argument finds all the premises reasonable to believe. That is, you think that they're true. Uh, you may not as ascribe a, a great deal of conviction to them, but at least you think they're, um, there's enough evidence in their favor to think they're true. So a deductively strong argument um, is a measure of how, uh, whether or not it's valid first and whether or not you find the premises reasonable. And what happens is, in that case, the argument would be deductively strong. So just let me give you an example, and we'll talk about some of the details. But here's a really simple, really obvious case that is um, <clears throat> probably a deductively strong argument for you. All mammals have warm blood. Bears are mammals. Therefore, bears have warm blood. So it's valid. It fits a pattern that if the premises were true, they guarantee the truth of the conclusion. And in fact, the premises are true. That is, if I was to ask you, do you think it's true or false that all mammals have warm blood? You'd probably say it's true. And do you think it's true or false that bears are mammals? You'd probably say it's true. So you think one and two are reasonable. So that means that the conclusion follows. Uh, so interesting feature now is that validity, which we've been considering so far, is an objective property of the arguments. But whether or not a premise is reasonable for you to believe depends on the person. And here's what I mean. Whether or not an argument is valid is an objective, mind-independent feature of the argument. So uh, whether somebody thinks about it or not, whether they think it's valid or not, that's, a, that's a, an objective character, a feature of it. It's valid or not, whether or not the person recognizes it. But reasonable depends on the person, depends to some extent on the background information, the training, the cognitive skills, and the beliefs of the person who's considering it. Different propositions are going to be reasonable for different people. So consider uh, Sarah Seeger is an astrophysicist and planetary scientist at MIT. She had just got a uh, MacArthur Genius recipient, uh, MacArthur Genius Award of a million dollars for um, her research. She's So she's one of the uh, most highly qualified and the most experienced and knowledgeable uh, physicists in the world uh, right now and contrast her to uh, there's a very small tribe of people the Sentinelese um, are by many people's reckoning the most isolated humans on the planet they're still living in the Stone Age they uh, use uh, spears and rocks to hunt and they have resisted and rejected any contact with the outside world <clears throat> in one case some fishermen um, fell asleep and their boat drifted too close to the island and uh, some of these people uh, went out and killed them. They've been utterly hostile to anybody's uh, contact and they don't know the first thing about 21st century uh, American or 21st century human living on planet Earth. They don't know what a cell phone is or cable television or Miley Cyrus, which is probably an advantage, or any of the other things that you know. So the uh, background information, the knowledge, the skills, um, the qualifications, the information they have between Sarah Seeger and the Sentinelese is vast. So radically different sets of propositions are going to be reasonable for these two uh, different people. Um, also consider not just um, people with different amounts of information, but over time these things change. So um, here's a sentence. Bubonic plague is caused by Yersinia pestis, which is the name of a bacteria. Here's Tom Frieden, the director of the Center for Disease Control. He's one of the foremost experts on infection diseases on the planet. He's got an MD from Columbia, specialty training in inf infectious diseases from Yale. He served as the New York City Health Commissioner. Um, and contrast his knowledge or his awareness and his background information that would uh, contribute to his opinion about that sentence, bubonic plague is caused by Yersinia pestis.
Francis, contrary to, say, some 1300s um, medieval healer. Um, where in the in the 1300s, not knowing what we know today, they thought the plague was caused by an imbalance of yellow bile and maybe some problem with your astrological forecast. Medieval doctors in the 1300s had a primitive theory of disease based on black bile, yellow bile, blood, phlegm, uh, astrology, and demon possession. So um, the real cause of the plague wouldn't even be discovered for 600 years. So these two people, are, again, are going to have radically different views about what's reasonable. Now the sentence at the top, the headline sentence, is true. And uh, Tom Frieden would tell you it's true, and he could give us uh, uh, a great deal of information that would uh, support and evidence in favor of that sentence as being true. Um, but what happens is that different sentences can appear to be true to people depending on their different information, and that leads us to this problem. So I'm going to introduce a concept here. Uh, it's called fallibilism. And the idea is that a person can have a well-justified, reasonable, but false belief. So circumstances can lead you to think that some sentence is true when in fact it's not, but you can be perfectly reasonable, well justified in thinking so. That is, if the circumstances conspire or the time or the uh, era or the information that's available all constrain you and lead you to some conclusion, it may be in fact false, but nobody could have known any better given the circumstances. So again, um, in the 1300s, it was reasonable for some illiterate peasant in a French village to think that bubonic plague was supernatural or caused by demon possession. Um, that same peasant in that French village couldn't possibly know in the 1300s that in 1894 we're going to discover the Yersinia pestis bacteria. Um, so now, knowing what we know, knowing what Dr. Tom Frieden knows, we should abandon the medieval belief because we know better. But in the 1300s, they had no idea. They had a well-justified, perhaps reasonable uh, belief that bubonic plague was uh, had a supernatural cause or it was some problem with your black and yellow bile or something. So they may well have had good reasons for thinking that, but they were just mistaken. Um, similarly, here's another example. So consider uh, John, uh, who has a typical K through 12 American education, he's completed two years of college, including some geology, physical sciences, and geography classes. So imagine that John's your roommate, and <clears throat> John confronts or considers this argument, or maybe you ask John, "Why do you think the Earth is round?" And he might say, "Well." If my textbooks and my teachers are reliable, then the Earth is round. And I think that generally my textbooks and my teachers are reliable, therefore the Earth is round. And actually, that's probably very much like the argument that would lead you to think the Earth is round. The reason you believe it is probably not because you checked it yourself, but because your textbooks and your college professors told you these things. So you've got some evidence, but it's indirect um, testimony from experts. You don't think the Earth is flat. Okay, so for John, this argument then, because he's had a professor tell him so, because his textbook said so, maybe because he's ran Google Earth, um, because he's run Google Earth, uh, this argument is valid. It has that format that we saw a few weeks ago. If P then Q, P therefore Q. It has, modus, it has the modus ponens structure that we talked about as being valid. And John believes the conditional in one. Now, um, we're going to get to it in a second. John believes both of both premises, but consider the first premise. What does the first premise say? Um, the second one's perhaps a bit easier to think about for a moment. John reflects on two and decides that for the most part, they are reliable. His textbooks and his teachers aren't perfect. They certainly are not, but they're generally trustworthy. So what does one say? Well, one says, if my textbooks and teachers are reliable, then the earth is round. What's that premise doing here? Well, what it's doing, in effect, is it's um, informing us that his textbooks and his teachers have told him that the earth is round. If, they're, if what they say is right, then the Earth is round, because they say it's round. All right, so we've got a deductively strong argument for John. It's valid, and he believes the premises, so he's rationally committed to accept the conclusion. He ought to accept the conclusion on pain of irrationality. He ought to accept that conclusion, and he does, and that's why you accept it. It's perfectly fine. Okay, so consider another example. Um, here's an argument that uh, you might think is... Uh, deductively strong for Marion, and in fact you should think that. So suppose Marion believes premise one. The United States has won every war it has ever fought. 
she had a poor education and she had lots of people she trusts who told them who never even mentioned Vietnam or they were mistaken about Vietnam too. So she believes one mistakenly. And we don't need to like go into the details about this. Just imagine that Marianne's not well informed or that, p that she's getting her information from bad sources. I have to pick on Fox News a little bit here because they're infamous for feeding out bad information. Um, uh, so suppose Marion thinks that we, uh, that the United States, always wins at war, its wars, and then somebody mentions that that we fought a war in Vietnam, and she doesn't know much else about it, so she just figures that we won. So this argument would be deductively strong for Marion, even though it has a false premise, and that's to say she believes one and two, and it's valid, so it's strong for her. But somebody else who looks at it. Um, me, for instance, I look at premise one and go, no, well, no, premise one is false. At least Vietnam was a loss. So one isn't true. And that's the exception that uh, proves the rule in this case. Okay, so what about this argument? Here's the same argument. For somebody else, the United States won every war it's ever fought. The United States fought a war in Vietnam. Therefore, the United States won the war in Vietnam. Well, this argument would be weak for John, for example, because he doesn't believe premise one. He knows about Vietnam and he rejects it. So the objection here would be John thinks correctly that Vietnam was a war the US fought but lost. That's to say that Vietnam is a counterexample to premise one. Now what's a counterexample? Well we're gonna, one of the things we're going to do this semester is talk about what proves a sentence false. And in this case a counterexample is what would prove premise one false because one makes this universal generalization. It says that all A's are B's. And the way you represent that um, diagrammatically is that the class of all A's, the smaller circle, fits inside the class of all B's. So if somebody claims that all A's are B's, what would be a counterexample? It would be an A that's not a B, an A that's outside of the B circle. So uh, all swans are white. What would it take to disprove all swans are white? A black swan. What would it take to disprove all Americans were born in the United States? We need an American who was not born in the United States. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of my other favorite examples, he would disprove that sentence. He's a counterexample to the all A's or B's claim. Uh, what about all women are bad drivers? So rather than just getting mad here, we want to be dispassionate and analyze the claim. And this is very easy to disprove. All you need is one woman who's not a bad driver. And I think we can make a good case that since she's a NASCAR, she's a much better driver than most of us, um, that Danica Patrick is not a bad driver. What about all women are poor at business? Uh, there's another one that's going to be inflammatory. Well, again, what would disprove it? A single woman is all it takes who's good at business, who's not bad at business. And Meg Whitman, who was the CEO of eBay and helped to uh, bring it to great success, is a really good example of someone who's um, uh, a woman who's not poor at business. So she's a counterexample to the all A's or B's claim. All right, so uh, let's consider some more uh, deductively strong or weak arguments and do a little analysis on them. So if an animal carries its young in its pouch, then it's a marsupial. Kangaroos are animals that carry their young in their pouch. Therefore, kangaroos are marsupials. Okay, so again, it's a really simple example just to illustrate the concept. So now I'm going to prep you for um, a homework assignment we're going to do very shortly. And in the homework assignment, we need to do a bunch of analysis. We need to answer a bunch of questions. So first question about this argument is, is the argument valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And right now we're wondering about deductively strong arguments, so we're really interested to see whether it's valid. And in fact, this one is valid. Okay, so that's a valid argument. Now what about the premises? Now, as you see it, and consider the premises separately, um, are the premises true, false, or do you suspend judgment? And there were the, there, you should always take some time to consider them in turn. Um, two is pretty easy. Two is pretty obviously true. If you can recognize that that's a kangaroo in the picture, you can see that they're carrying their young in their pouch. So two is e easy. It's obviously true. But what about one? Now, most folks, if you remember, and here's the, here's the kicker, if you remember what a marsupial is, you'll think that one is true. But you might not remember what that term marsupial means, or you may not have heard it before, or you may not have taken the time to look it up. So you might not be sure. You might just look at one and go, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure about one. So in that case, you might suspend judgment. Now, 
here's where things split out because one person might look at one and two and say these are true and true and another person might look at one and say well I'm suspending judgment about one but I think two is true so the, this argument is going to have a different status it's going to be deductively strong for the person who thinks that both, both premises are true but it will be weak for anybody who suspends judgment or thinks that any of the premises are false all right, so if you, SJ, if you suspend judgment about a premise or one or more premises, or if you think a premise is false, then the argument's automatically weak because the um, criteria for deductively strong arguments is that it must be valid and it must, uh, you must think that the premises are true. So you must have, have true across the board. Okay, let's consider some other examples. What about if an animal is a cold-blooded reptile and then its body temperature is affected dramatically by the ambient temperature. Snakes are cold-blooded reptiles, therefore snakes' body temperatures are affected dramatically by the ambient temperature. Okay, so first question, is the argument valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And you ought to be recognizing this as a valid argument form. We've seen this lots of times now, so it ought to be easy. That's valid. If those premises are true, they guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So it follows the pattern and fits the bill for being valid. Now the question is, do you think each one of the premises is true, false, or do you suspend judgment? Now, um, you might, again, suspend judgment about premise one. And I've heard people do this because they look at it and say, well, I'm not sure what ambient means. Now, what I would encourage you to do, for God's sake, is go look it up at the dictionary, right? You don't use Google. So if you run into a word on a homework assignment or a problem or reading the newspaper, for that matter, uh, look it up in the dictionary and find out what it means. And you'll add a new word to your repertoire and you'll be able to impress your friends and, and uh, get a hot date, maybe, with the right person. Uh, but suppose you're not going to bother, or suppose you're confused about it. Maybe you're not sure, or maybe you've got some other reasons, or you're just not that familiar with um, the definitions for reptiles and cold-blooded and the like. So you might suspend judgment about one. Again, you're not sure, like the marsupial case. So now we've got a case for a person um, where if we ask this question, is the argument deductively strong, inductively strong, or weak? You'd have to say it's weak because you're suspending judgment about premise one. Now, I haven't said anything about inductively strong arguments yet. I'm going too soon, but for today we're just going to look at deductively strong and weak arguments. And for now I can say that if you um, think any of the premises are false, if the argument is ill-formed, or if you suspend judgment about any of the premises, then that argument is going to be, uh, is going to be weak. That's an automatic disqualification. So the strict requirement here for a deductively strong argument is it's valid and you believe the premises. Now what about this one? If mega doses of vitamin C prevent colds, then people who take them would get fewer colds than people who don't. People who take mega doses of vitamin C don't get fewer colds than people who don't. Therefore, mega doses of vitamin C don't work to prevent colds. All right, so this is complicated and it's got a lot of negations in it. The first question is Is the argument valid? cogent or ill-formed. And you all recognize that this follows that modus tollens pattern. It says if P then Q, um, uh, if, if P then Q, and the second premise is uh, not Q, therefore not P. All right, so that's a valid argument pattern that works that's perfectly fine. So it's a candidate to be deductively strong. But now what about the premises? Do you think that one is true, false, or suspend judgment? Do you think two is true, false, or suspend judgment? So I'll just give away what it is for me versus what it might be for you. So premise one, if mega doses of vitamin C prevent colds, then people who take them would get fewer colds than people who don't. That seems to make sense, right? I mean, lots of people seem to think that if you take a lot of vitamin C, that'll keep you from getting cold. So if we compared those people to people who weren't taking the vitamin C, you'd expect them to get fewer colds. So one makes sense. One seems like that's what it means to say it works or that um, it prevents colds. So I'm prepared to accept one. Maybe you are too. Hope you are too. Now what about two? People who, do, who take mega doses of vitamin C don't get fewer colds than people who don't take 
mega doses of vitamin C. Now, honestly, I think you might have contrary experience about this than me, or you might suspend judgment about, the, about this than me. I'll just tell you about my situation. I think premise two is true, and the reason is I've actually looked at some of the research on this. They've gone out and done some clinical double-blind uh, trials where they've actually given people mega doses of vitamin C, and they've watched to see what the cold rates are. And the cold, the rate of colds in those two groups of people hasn't significantly deviated. So I think that premise two is true. Now maybe now that you've heard that from me, you might accept it too. But you might, uh, on first glance, you might have read two and thought to yourself, well, I took uh, mega doses of vitamin C once, or I've done it routinely, and it's prevented me from getting colds, or my roommate takes it and doesn't get colds. Or I've heard that if you take a lot of vitamin C, then you won't get a cold. So you might have your doubts about two. You might even think two is false the first time you read it, not having heard that bit from me. So notice that as we have exchanges, as we interact, our information changes and our evidence changes and the status of some sentence changes and your attitude about it ought to shift around. Your, your beliefs ought to be responsive to the evidence. So if you believe me about two, having and you believe that I've gone and looked at the research and that sounds plausible to you, then you might accept two as well. In which case, if we ask this question, question, is it deductively strong, inductively strong, or weak, um, we'd have to say, well, since I find both premises true, uh, that's actually inverted. Since I find both premises true, I ought to, uh, uh, the, the argument's deductively strong for me, and since uh, perhaps, let's imagine somebody who thinks the second premise is false, that argument would be weak for them. So there'll be a good uh, test to see if you catch that inversion there um, from watching the lecture and um, on the quiz. All right, so let's consider an even more controversial example. How about this argument? Either humans evolved over billions of years from simpler forms of life, or the Bible is correct, and they were created in their present form 6,000 years ago by God. The Bible isn't correct, and they were not created in their present form 6,000 years ago by God. Therefore, humans evolved over billions of years from simpler forms of life. So we're already getting right to the big religious controversy. Now the question is, let's analyze this argument and separate it out and figure out what's, what's good about it, what's bad about it. So first question, is it valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And it's valid. It says either A or B, uh, not B, therefore A. So it's got a very simple, very rudimentary, uh, valid argument pattern one we've seen before. Now what about the premises? Well, the first premise. You might look at the first premise, probably look at the first premise and go, yeah, those are really the two games in town. Either we evolved over billions of years or the whole Adam and Eve, um, Garden of Eden, Genesis story is right. And I know lots of people who sort of see those as the two live viable options. So premise one just presents us with two options. It doesn't force us to pick yet. It just says, well, either this happened or that happened. So it's like, it's a little bit like saying that the defendant is either guilty or not guilty. Well, either we evolved or the Genesis story is right. Um, which one of those is going to be right, and that's really what the question is. So now, when you look at Americans, for instance, on premise two, they split out over premise uh, two. So, so some people that we'll call naturalists think that premise two is true. They're going to deny that the Earth is 6,000 years old. They're going to point to well, lots of evidence, and, and, and I, I think they're right about this, right? We've got rocks in your backyard that are older than 6,000 years. Um, so lots of people um, will accept uh, premise two as true, but as many as 40 to 42 percent of Americans are known as young earth creationists. So when you ask them this question, that's 42, four in ten people, when you ask them this question, um, they will reject premise two, my premise two, and they will say, no, I think that something like the literal um, creation story from the book of Genesis is right. So a, a very significant minority of Americans actually reject my premise two and think that young earth creationism is correct. So for those folks, if we ask this question, is the argument deductively strong, inductively strong, or weak? Well, the naturalist is going to look at it, and because they think premise two is true, they're going to think this, this argument is deductively strong for them, and the young earth creationist is going to find this argument to be weak because they reject premise two. Now, then notice we can zero in this, this structure and this system we're using here allows us to zero in on exactly where the disagreement is and what these people are disagreeing about. And we've figured out exactly what it is. It's about premise two, and that's where the controversy would be.
All right, so I won't pretend to settle that today. Um, let's consider some other examples. How about this argument? Lots of people I know have insisted that airborne works to make their colds better. I like these cold remedy examples. A school teacher invented it, and she says that it works. If airborne works to prevent colds, then people who report that it works and are, are reliable sources of information, they'd say that it works. Therefore, airborne prevents airborne works to prevent colds. Uh, so the idea, the question, first question is, is the argument valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And the reason I give this argument is that this is conversationally much more like something you hear somebody say. Somebody go, well, I took it and I got better, or I took it and I didn't get a cold. Um, you know, and a, a school teacher invented it, so there's going to be something to it. It says it right there on the box, right? Um, in fact, that you can, you know, what can say for you, and this stuff's on the shelf right there with, uh, with lots of other approved, uh, medically approved treatments for cold medication. So something like this reasoning in 1, 2, 3, and 4 has led, you know, uh, millions of Americans to buy this stuff, and the airborne companies made billions and billions of dollars. So first question is about the logical structure. Is it valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And in fact, this one is ill-formed. It's, it makes the mistake of affirming the consequent. If you go back to one of our deductive validity lectures, you'll see that. Um, it's got missing premises. The language doesn't match. It really doesn't make much sense. Um, it doesn't get the, the premises, even if they're true, they don't give me a reason to think that they, they don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. That is, the, the mere fact in one that lots of people you know have insisted that it works doesn't suggest that it works. Because lots of people believe lots of crazy things, and it's not true. A school teacher invented it, and she says that it works. Does that guarantee that the conclusion is true? No. What about the third premise? If airborne works to prevent colds, then people would report that it works, and reliable sources would say that it does. Well, three um, tries to strap together one and two and say, well, look, if a bunch of people say it works, and if a school teacher uh, invented it, then that seems to support it. But notice the structure of it, right? It says, if it works, then you expect to have these people, these things happen. And they do happen, so it must work. But that's, that's inversion, that's an affirming the consequent example. Um, and we saw a bunch of examples in an earlier lecture about why that's a uh, poor way, an illogical way to reason. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and ask these questions. Are the premises true, false, or do you suspend judgment? And I, for one, uh, think that probably premises one, two, and three are true. Lots of people I do know, I know, have insisted that it works, and it looks like a school teacher did invent it. I looked this one up too. And if it worked, you might expect lots of people to report it. But since it's ill formed, since the logic is so poor in this thing, it's got to be weak. Okay, so I'll give you some more examples about stuff people believe. If many people claim that something is true and they are earnest, sincere, and seem to be completely convinced, then the claim is true. Many people claim that ghosts are real. They are, they are earnest, sincere, and seem to be completely convinced. Therefore, ghosts are real. Okay, so argument, is it valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And this one's valid. You ought to see that now. It says if P then Q, P therefore Q. Now, what about the premises? Are they true, false, or do you suspend judgment? And again, here I'm going to part company with lots of people. Um, I think many people would look at premise one and go, you know, if a lot of people say something's true and they really mean it and they're earnest and they seem to be completely convinced, then that claim is probably true. Um, so I'm going to call them gullible, but I'm going to say many more people, are, many people are more gullible than I am about that premise one. That the mere fact that lots of people say it and they really seem to mean it and genuinely believe it, that that's enough to sort of to justify it for them. Um, so lots of people say premise one is true, and premise two um, is half of Americans. A lot of Americans think that ghosts are real. So if a lot of people think ghosts are real. Um, then, then it must be true, and a lot of people do think it's true it's, that they're real, so they, therefore they must be real. Is roughly the structure of this argument. So it's valid. It's got true premises for many people. Is it therefore is it strong, deductively strong, inductively strong, or weak? And for many people, I think this argument would be deductively strong because they accept the first premise. But uh, the problem is that in the first premise. Um, and, and this is why critical thinking ruins your life, is that I can rattle off a lot of examples of cases where people were genuine, they were earnest, they were sincere, they were completely convinced, um, and the thing that they believe just turned out to be dead wrong. 
Um, and Ghost is one of them, right? Uh, we investigate these claims and they don't they never pan out. Airborne's another one. Lots of these cold remedies are examples of cases where people really fervently, genuinely believe it. There's a significant percentage of the population who still thinks that Obama, uh, President Obama, is a Muslim. And it's just flatly false. Uh, but there's lots of people who sincerely believe it, right? So um, we can give lots of counterexamples to premise one. So I think premise one is uh, is sketchy. I'm not going to accept it. But somebody who thinks premise one is true, and um, given that the argument's valid, they would think this whole argument is deductively strong. It would be deductively strong for them. Okay, let me pick on astrology a little bit more before we wrap up here. If astrology works, then a higher percentage of people who are Pisces would be reasonable, artistic, and quiet than other parts of the population. And I just pulled this out of a, a description of what it is to be a Pisces. So, and I'm just trying to figure out what it means to say it works. Um, you know, Pisces people are supposed to be reasonable, artistic, and quiet. That's what it says in your astrological forecast. So if astrology, if there's something to it, then you'd expect that to be true of them, right? Um, now, premise two says it's not the case that a higher percentage of Pisces are reasonable, artistic, and quiet than other parts of the population. Therefore, astrology doesn't work. Okay, so first questions about the logical form. Is it valid, cogent, or ill-formed? And this one's valid. Are the premises true, false, or do you suspend judgment? Uh, I think premise one is true. If astrology works, then we'd expect to see these different character traits. And what about premise two? It's not the case that Pisces are more reasonable, artistic, or quiet than other people. Now, I think that's true. Uh, partly because I've looked at research on this and I've looked at psychologists trying to uh, quantify personality properties and see if they're distributed any differently in the population depending on what month you're born in. And it looks like there's no evidence for thinking that's true. Um, but you might think, depending on your experience, depending on your background and the information you've got about astrology, you might think that this premise too is false. False because this is not. Um, and you might think because Pisces really are reasonable artistic people. You know some and that's got you convinced. So if you know some Pisces who are reasonable artistic quiet people and you're convinced that those are properties or characteristics that are distinct for Pisces people, then you'd have to reject two because two says it's not the case. So for, for a person like that, this argument would be weak, but for me it would be deductively strong. And that means I'm rationally committed to accept the conclusion astrology doesn't work, and I'm fine with that. Um, but you would reject the uh, argument as weak because you're rejecting premise two. Now, my suspicion, and I said this in the last lecture too, and I'm going to say it again because it bears repeating, my suspicion is that it's confirmation bias that leads lots of people to think that things like astrology work. And here's what that means. The reason that so many people think that premise two is true is confirmation bias. That, and this is the tendency to look for evidence that confirms a favored hypothesis or belief while neglecting or ignoring evidence that would disprove it. So somewhere along the line it got stuck in your head that Pisces are artistic. You read that somewhere or it just seemed uh, right to you or you put it together at some point. And then when someone you happen, who happens to be both of those things, you meet somebody who's an artist and they say, oh, I'm a Pisces. Um, that jumps out at you and that like catches your attention and you um, notice that. It confirms this belief you have. The thing is, the question is, were you keeping track of the non-artistic Pisces you meet? Probably not. You weren't checking to see how many people have I met who are Pisces and how many of them are artistic. And the other problem here is that most people think they're artistic even when they suck at it. Um, and you probably weren't also keeping track of the artist or the artistic people you meet who are non-Pisces. There's these other groups of people that you haven't been um, factoring into your data set. You've just been picking out the cherry picking the examples that fit with this pet idea about Pisces being artistic and neglecting all the other information. So my suspicion is that for lots of people who believe in astrology, what they're doing is they're cherry picking evidence that makes it seem that way when in fact the rates of these character properties in the population are evenly distributed across all 12 months. It just doesn't happen that, um, that one month gets more artists than another.
Uh, and that's why, and this the, the same thing happens, and this is going to bug some people, but here's why. The same thing happens when people think this is true. They think Asians are bad drivers. They're often committing confirmation bias when they uh, assert that. And you've heard somebody say it, right? And they'll point somebody out and say, see, there's a bad Asian driver. Well, they're picking out evidence that um, supports this pet belief, and they're neglecting the non-Asian bad drivers, the non-Asian good drivers, and the um, Asian good drivers. They're neglecting these other properties these other sets that would give us rates and let us compare and let us see that that sentence is probably uh, is, is false. The same thing for women are bad at science. People will pick out examples that support the idea and don't uh, uh, emphasize any other ones that would disprove it. Um, like that Sarah Seeger who I had in this lecture. Right? There's lots of uh, prominent women and uh, very good at science and they disprove the claim. But when we select our evidence you can make it look like something's true when it's not. Um, another one that's really common is that bad things happen on a full moon or Friday the 13th is bad luck. Lots of people talk to an emergency room nurse or a cop and ask them about full moons and they'll go, oh, there's all kinds of bad things that happen around the, around the full moon. But in fact, they're, they're committing confirmation bias too. Um, what happened is they noticed that cop was out on the street on the full moon and noticed it was a full moon and then noticed something bad happening and looked at uh, her partner and said, uh, see, I told you, it always happens, a full moon. It's always bad and then they start picking out these cases and building up the uh, building up the argument building up the case for themselves by selectively um, biasing the evidence um, okay so for more information on that again let's get, take a look at the confirmation bias lecture okay so to wrap up then a deductively strong argument is one of these it's uh, a valid argument and it's one where you find all the premises to be reasonable but if you suspend judgment or you think any of them are false then it's weak Fallibilism is this idea that somebody can have a well-justified and reasonable belief, but it also turns out to be false. So you can do all your homework and investigate something and know everything there is to know about it, you know, given your time, um, given what's going on around you, given the context, and still get it wrong. And we'd say, well, you did your homework and you learned it all and you were uh, justified, but you weren't uh, correct. So it can happen you're mistaken. Um, Ill-formed arguments are weak. So uh, one of the things we've, that sort of come out in this discussion is that um, you know, there's several ways for an argument to come out to be weak. One of them is if the logic is bad, if it's ill-formed, it's weak. If you think premises are false, then it's weak. If you suspend judgment about premises, then it's weak. Uh, arguments with premises that you think are false or suspend judgment about are weak. And confirmation bias is the mistake of cherry-picking evidence that supports a favored belief while neglecting evidence that would disprove it. Okay, so our next discussion is going to be about inductively strong arguments, and that will help prepare us for the homework assignment that's coming up shortly.